Good evening. My name is Robert Pine. I direct the Norman Miller Center for Peace, Justice, and Public Understanding here at St. Norbert College. At the Norman Miller Center, we partner with all academic disciplines in cultivating awareness, compassion, and commitment to justice in the building of sustainable peace. Our co-curricular programs seek peace in the broadest sense as shalom, and we pursue justice not as revenge, but as the establishment of what is right. One of the ways we pursue these goals is through the Norman and Lewis Miller Lecture in Public Understanding. That series promotes unity, communication, and tolerance among different cultures, religions, ethnicities, and traditions. For 26 years, these lectures have celebrated human dignity and they've encouraged better understanding between people, both domestically and internationally. Tonight, thanks to COVID-19, we have a first, a Miller Lecture virtual event. We have just a few students here with us live, but most of you, including our much anticipated guest, Ms. Lee McBowie, will be connecting with us virtually. If you're with us tonight via Zoom, please feel free to submit questions through the chat feature. I will see those and if possible, relay them to Ms. Lema at the appropriate time. When meeting virtually, it seems especially important to pause and recognize our connection to place. Here at St. Norbert College in the spirit of the Norbertine value of stabilitas loci, a deep commitment to the local community. We acknowledge that the land on which we meet is the ancestral home of the Menominee Nation, which holds historical, cultural, and sacred significance to the community. We acknowledge the living history and contributions of the indigenous communities that inhabited this land prior to the establishment of St. Norbert College, as well as the sovereign Native American nations who continue to to contribute to the flourishing of our communities. We also look forward to the day when once again we break bread together in this place. I would now like to introduce Cody Zarnke, a senior in her third year as a community organizer at the Norman Miller Center. Cody will graduate early this December with a degree in English and minors in women's and gender studies and peace and justice. She is particularly interested in women's rights and in addressing injustice through community action. Cody, welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Bob. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest. Ms. Leigh McBowie is a Liberian peace activist, social worker, women's rights advocate, and 2011 Nobel Peace Laureate. As founder and president of the McBowie Peace Foundation Africa, her work seeks to provide educational and leadership opportunities to girls, women, and youth to empower the next generation of peace builders and democratic leaders in West Africa. Ms. Bowie currently serves as Executive Director of the Women, Peace, and Security Program at Columbia University's Earth Institute. She is also a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory, Advisory Board on Mediation, the World Refugee Council, and the African Women Leaders Network. Previously, Ms. Kaboe was the founding head of the Liberia Reconciliation Initiative and co-founder and former executive director of Women, Peace, and Security Network Africa. She is also a founding member and former Liberian coordinator of the West Africa Network for Peacebuilding. And this year, Ms. Kaboe joined the Higher Committee of Human Fraternity, a multi-faith committee dedicated to fostering peaceful coexistence through dialogue. Ms. Lema is best known for leading a women's peace movement, which played a pivotal role in ending Liberia's civil war in 2003. Inspired by a dream and as a person of faith, she organized her fellow Christian women to mobilize for peace. She then collaborated with a Muslim partner to organize Christian and Muslim women in the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. Dressed in white, these thousands of women staged pray-ins and nonviolent protests demanding reconciliation and peace talks. Ms. Lema's story of leadership, as told in the 2008 documentary Pray the Devil Back to Hell, 
and her 2011 memoir, Mighty Be Our Powers, How Sisterhood, Prayer, and Sex Changed a Nation at War, demonstrates the power of social cohesion and relationship building in the face of political unrest and social turmoil. From 2014 to 2016, Ms. Bowie once again rallied together with the brave Liberian women whom she protested alongside during the Civil War to fight a new battle threatening Liberia's peace and progress, the Ebola crisis. Liberian women were at the forefront in efforts to educate, inform, and equip communities to contain and prevent the spread of the disease. Tonight, we turn to Leigh McBowie while re reeling from another public health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we foster resilience and connection as a community during this time of uncertainty and division? Consistent with the purposes of the Norman and Lewis Miller Lecture Series, Ms. Bowie wrote, quote, in the middle of this heartbreaking pandemic, notice that it is alerting our global citizens regardless of race, status, and accomplishments, to rethink life, our interactions, and attitudes towards the other and many more. This moment in our global history has forcibly reminded us of the inevitable truth, that we are more connected than we are divided." End quote. Especially on this day, the International Day of Peace, we are delighted to welcome Ms. Lema Gaboe. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm extremely delighted that I'm still awake and my tongue is still intact. It's almost 12 midnight here in Ghana. It's 12 midnight in Ghana, where I'm calling in from. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank profoundly the Norbert, St. Norbert College for inviting me as a speaker to the Miller Lecture event. So much has changed in a very short time. I've spent six months in Ghana, five of those months in quarantine or lockdown, as we call it. Airports have been shut down all over the world. Our interactions, including this program, is showing us that a lot has changed. It feels like we've gone two years into 2020. Prior to the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, many communities outside of the global north suffered from many different problems. Wars from Syria to Yemen, Congo to South Sudan. Many of these places were filled with different crises farming in some parts of the world, economic hardship, and many more. The impact of these problems on the lives of individuals is something that we cannot continue to overstate or understate, but it's been really hell for many people. My latest travel prior to the COVID pandemic last year, April, specifically was to, South, to Cameroon, where over a period of three years, they've been involved in the conflict between the Anglophone and the Francophone. Very little is known globally about that conflict. I went in there to do something called a peace exploratory mission. A lot had been done in terms of death and destruction. Many young children have been out of school for three years in that area. Those who dare to decide to go to school, if they are unfortunate and caught on the way to school, get their arms chopped off. The depth of the problem in that part of the world is something that a lot of people know nothing about. Recent appeal from Yemen about the the crisis and the hunger that is striking a lot of people is also evident of the problems that the world was facing prior to COVID-19. And I can go on listing countries that had all kinds of crises. Sadly, nations of the, some nations of the global north were basically apathetic 
about the humanitarian concerns, particularly in some countries where they didn't have political or economic interests or policy interests. In recent elections of individuals who have little or no interest in international cooperation, can you all hear me? In recent elections of individuals who have little or no interest in international cooperation has exacerbated the problem. I spend a lot of my time also traveling between international meetings, listening to appeals from different parts of the world. And I can emphatically say that when I started this work 20 years ago, there was a lot of generosity towards humanitarian needs and humanitarian concern than what we see in the last few years of our world. From the onset of the pandemic, many nations went primarily into individualistic mode. World leaders failed to turn to the international order to generate unified solution. Sadly, the individualistic mindset with which many world leaders operated at the onset of the pandemic did not only hurt the global fraternity, but also impacted adversely local communities in all of these countries. This has somehow been a blessing in disguise. Borders were shut. People were only thinking about the nationals. No one was talking about collective efforts to save humanity. Some leaders referred to the virus as the Chinese virus in the early stage of the pandemic. This again led to a lot. And we're still seeing a lack of leadership within the world, amongst the world leaders. When it comes to the vaccine, there is no one global understanding. Everyone is fighting to be the first to do this. So we've seen our world shattered by the individual mindset. But I say that this has also been a blessing in disguise because it led to many communities grappling for solution in the sea of uncertainty. No one had dealt with COVID before. No one knew what was going to happen with this virus. No one had any understanding. So people were basically drowning and holding on to Stroy for their lifeline. In the midst of these uncertainties, communities then also had to deal with age-old, unresolved, systemic structural issues like racism, sexual violence, increased domestic violence as a result of the lockdown in many places, police brutality, divisive political rhetorics, just to name a few. But what these problems has done is basically propel communities to design and implement homegrown solutions. So let me step back from the international and come to the local. When the pandemic struck, we were fast to leave New York because I felt like if I had stayed in New York by now, I would be in a ward of a mental institution. I needed to be on a continent. I needed to be in a space where I could contribute my quota to a community that needed my ability the most. We got here and the first thing that I did was to call and say, we need to start putting PSAs out. In as much as we did not have any understanding of what COVID was, we had an understanding of the Ebola epidemic. We knew that a public health crisis would not just be a public health crisis, but it would be a crisis that would bring out a lot more of problems. So the first thing we did was to begin to mobilize journalists, local community activists to say, how do we put the message out there that we are again confronted with a public health crisis. The difference with this public health crisis now as compared to the Ebola epidemic is that in this crisis, we do not have saviors. Every leader is fighting for their nation. Every country is fighting for their people. Even though they are doing it wrongly, but we need now, as, as we say in Liberia, right now where the world is, is everyone for themselves and God for all. 
That's a local saying we have in Liberia. So we begin to put out, we got into community mode. Let's put out announcement. Let's use our voices and tell people that this pandemic is real. Because there was a lot of myth around the pandemic. One of the biggest myth that would threaten our communities if we didn't act fast was the myth that the virus could not attack black people, specifically Africans. So we had to deal with that first. Let's do away with this myth. This is not a virus that is just for one race. This is a virus that will attack anyone. It's not just for old people, it's for young people, as we've seen all over the place. The other thing that we decided to do in this moment was, as governments were calling for lockdown, we knew that in countries where they had the economic strength, these lockdowns would mean stimulus packages or some kind of relief for citizens. But in our space, a space like Liberia, where we did not have a government to give stimulus packages, we needed to mobilize community to do something for the people. So what I saw, I have never seen in the over 25 years of my, ex of my work as an activist. Communities immediately mobilized, started buying rice and water. On one day, we distributed over 80,000 gallons of water to communities that did not have. Some days we had to take food. And because we we'll go into these communities and do a listing of the people who are deeply in need, especially those who were bedridden families who had a lot of children, what we observed as my team went into these communities, people showed up. But when people showed up, community members who were benefiting from the food ration and the water ration was more than okay for us to share with those who had not been listed. Young people, young Liberians who live in the U.S. and other parts of the world started GoFundMe. People were sending money. And as you all know, this was the period of graduation in the U.S. We saw a lot of young people saying, please do not give me graduation presents. Give me money so that I can buy food to send back to my community. I'm currently stuck in Ghana, and that was the same spirit that we saw here. Every day you walk the streets, you saw people stopping their cars, opening the trunk, taking out food and serving it out to other people. So that spirit of our collective humanity was harnessed in the midst of world leaders, national leaders, thinking only about the politics of the COVID crisis. Grass, the second thing that happened was that in the midst of the pandemic, there were groups that had been, that were suffering from different forms of violence as the U.S. and other parts of the world were protesting the death of people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. In our part of the world, women were mobilizing, youth were mobilizing and protesting the increase in rape, sexual violence, and all of the different things that we had seen at different levels. We continue to use our voices to direct government into, this is where we think you should focus your attention. We, we, we begin to use our voices again to say to the international community that this is not the way for peace. This is not the way for justice. If we do manage this COVID crisis, the way it should be managed, we'll find ourselves in serious problem. Like the Ebola crisis, like the Ebola epidemic, again, women were mobilized, youth were mobilized. One of the most interesting things for me was getting a letter on Facebook from a group of young people saying, our community has 16 entry points. We've been able to put checkpoints at about 10 of these entry points. We need resources to put checkpoints at the remaining six. So what are they talking about checkpoints? These checkpoints, which are entry points into the communities, young people had thermometers, they had sanitizers, they had water, they had soap, and every individual, including cars that were driving into the community, had to stop, get their temperature checked, wash their hands, sanitize, and get back into their car to drive in. 
I was totally blown away, but this was not just the only thing from this group. In almost every community, young people were mobilizing. We saw again the power of a resilient community when everyone should have sat down and put their hands between their legs to say, oh, the government is supposed to do this. People got up, people mobilized, people rallied, and people started doing it. One of the defining moments when it became clear that we needed to do the max wearing was going around and asking people questions because immediately that mandate was put down. I decided, let me ask people who may not necessarily be able to afford. And for those of you watching or listening to this, it's so easy to say $1, I can get it to buy a face mask. I asked my driver here in Ghana, I said to him, if you had a dollar and you were supposed to buy a face mask versus buying bread for your children, what would you choose to do? He said, I'll buy bread for my children. And so again, that brought something to my mind. If we needed to save the lives of people, we needed to make masks available for those who make masks wearing, not a problem for those who couldn't afford. So we went straight into max production mode again and started free distribution for poor population, for people in places where, like, for example, we went to the banks and distributed max to tell us we went to the market grounds and gave to women. We went to, they, they have the motorbike taxis in Liberia. We we're giving to the boys who were riding the motorbikes to say, you need to be protected. Those were some of the things. And then at one point, when everything was going crazy, we realized that everyone was giving to communities, but no one was thinking about the prisons. So again, we mobilized resources to take water to the prison. Because in as much as these are people who have committed crimes, we also must realize that in these times, it is time for all of us to harness our collective humanity. And we cannot do that if we are exclusive or we exclude a particular group of people based on how we feel or think they've conducted their lives. So we decided, let's do the prison also. Let's do areas where there were, there's an area where I visit regularly with young people who are drug addicts. We also had to go into that community to make some donations to some of these young people. For the first time, and I will state this again, in many years, I observe the COVID pandemic awakening the humanity in communities. Relationships in these communities were built, built past religious line, built past ethnic line, built past social status. Relationships were rekindled. Relationships were rehashed, reconciliation took place in the midst of the pandemic. It is known that relationships that are built during hard times can be exceptionally re resilient. But when we build these relationships in hard times, we also have to begin to think, how do we cultivate this relationship past the crisis? How do we cultivate this relationship beyond the period of need? Some of the lessons that we learned, but let me take a step back to say that what we saw in Liberia, Ghana, and other parts of Africa was not just limited to those parts of Africa. Some of my kids were stuck in New York, and they would tell me that there were places in the U.S., and we saw it on the internet, on the news, we're giving roles. Governments fail. Governments fail miserably all over the world. Some governments fail their people. But people rose to the occasion and gave people hope in humanity again. What we saw prior to COVID was a world where we were consistently and persistently wondering if individualism was going to kill the world. 
one of the blessings of COVID was that it came at a time when we thought there was no hope for humanity. We had gotten too selfish. Um, social media and technology had made all of us. But today, at the end of the COVID pandemic, or in the midst of the COVID, COVID pandemic, we are beginning to see people say, oh my God, because we had all the time with our laptops and our iPhones and our iPad, we realized those iPads and iPhones could not give us hugs. Those iPads and iPhone could not really make a, a substitute the physical conversation. Those iPads and iPhones could not necessarily give you the kind of comfort you needed. On Mother's Day, my children decided to do a Zoom call. Oh, my heart was filled with so much joy, but also with a lot of sadness because I wanted to be in a room with all eight of my children. I wanted to be in a space where I would cook and just watch them eat. Today, we've seen that drive-by birthday parties and drive-by baby showers and all of the different things that the world has invented has just made us to realize that we are connected. Our humanity is so close together. And so the challenge that is posed to you and I is how do we keep this going post-COVID? How do we continue to see the good in you and I? How do we continue to give to the needs of those oppressed and suppressed? Yes, our world is still filled with the challenges. But the one thing that I've come to realize is that all of these evil that we see in the world from racism to police brutality to all of the different things thrive when good people are silent we did not see the kind of death that they had the experts had predicted as it results as it relates to hunger homelessness suicide and all of the different things we didn't see the spike in death as people had predicted, because humanity stepped up to the occasion. People stepped up to the occasion. And I think some of the lessons that we need to take from this period is our mutual support for one another, self-sacrifice for the good of all. These are things that we need to think about, following guidelines in the interest of people, and so today, everyone is saying we need to max up, we need to sanitize, we need to social distance. At the end of this pandemic, when we all have found a solution to this, I'm hopeful that the protocol will be we need to treat each other right. We need to have a police that engage with black and brown people just as they engage with white people, that the new world order will be climate change will be prioritized or the climate crisis, that sustainability will be the thing. So even though we would have ended the COVID crisis, but the protocols that we all are getting used to, we will use those protocols to push our world into peace, justice, and in the interest of all of those things, holding on to our collective humanity, we can no longer go back to that place after this period where we've seen at the community level, people really rallying around group of individuals and say, we have to go back to this, no. Today we are seeing men and women who had never really been involved in activism, getting into the, the groove of activism, if I have to call it that. We, if we haven't seen young people who were on the sidelines, we're seeing them step in. Recently, we ha I had a problem with one of my students. She alerted me that she had been sexually violated and the person who violated her had videoed the, the, part the incident without her knowledge and were now threatening to put it on social media in the midst of this COVID. We tried to get in touch with the young man to dissuade him from doing that. We could not get in touch with him. This young lady got so sick and tired of being threatened with this thing. She went on Instagram and posted everything, wrote her story, and it kind of like started a whole Me Too process with young girls between the ages of 18 and 25 in Liberia. Three of these young girls decided we want to do a protest because we've seen 
a spike in rape cases in our communities. We want to do a protest, we want to do a protest. So these are young people in their 20s deciding they're going to protest this huge pandemic, rape, just as COVID, they were going to protest. They sent a budget to my foundation and to imagine that they were probably thinking, okay, maybe 20 of our friends will show up and we're going to do this. Their budget was about $400 for water, for transportation, for everything. Next thing, they put their flyer out. Other young people saw it and said, can we partner? So long story short, they had about six or seven other organizations join them. They didn't even have resources to do media engagement. So sitting down from my hideout in Ghana, I'm always scheming. So I managed to get the media in Liberia to talk to them. I'm using myself as a bid. I'll talk to you, but I want you to, you will interview me, but I want you to interview these young people also. So we get them and the journalist asked me, do you support their protest? And I said, yes. So beyond that, I invite all of my students to join them. These young people go out on day one to protest and about 2,000 people showed up. By day two, they could not manage the crowd. They were totally blown away by the number of people who came out. By day three, the police and the government decided to crack down on their protest because it was gaining too much traction. But what this protest, even though they, they cracked down on it, had led to was a conference on sexual and gender-based violence that other groups have been fighting for over the period and they didn't get, and our president declaring rape as a national emergency. I'm only saying this to say that in these moments, in these trying moments, you see people wake up from places and spaces that we never really imagine them to rise up from and to put their energy out there. The question to all of us, those of us who find ourselves in these spaces where we are protective of people, those of us who find ourselves in these spaces where we, 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 we call ourselves activists and we have the global platform, how do we continue this spirit, this spirit of collectiveness, this spirit of resilience? How do we do it in the face of all of the crises our world is facing, in the face of all of the crises? How do we continue to encourage the young people that are protesting? How do we continue to encourage people who have lost faith in humanity and as part of this COVID period begin to regain their faith in humanity? It's time for us to think about all of these things. But beyond that, how do we translate all of these gains in our, from our different communities into gains that will benefit our nations and the world at large? Thank you all. I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, is, uh, that, that, that gives us a lot to think about as we think about how, how best to translate these gains that we've made into those that will help all of humanity. So my initial question for you that comes to mind as you talk about the collective resilience and the, the, uh, the surprise benefit of nations being forced to act on their own is how do we cultivate that in a nation that is far more individualistic and so divided here in the United States? We have people divided over what's actually happening with the virus. We have people, some saying that it's not real, that we don't need masks. We're in the middle of one of the most hotly contested political debates, presidential races that we can imagine. How do you build that kind of collective resilience in the midst of such division and such individualism? You know, I think as we look at our world as it is, one of the biggest problems we have today is leadership in the world. Um, yesterday, I had the honor of being a part of something called the Doha Debates. And as part of the Doha Debates, the question was, 
whether we, need, we replace all of the global entities that we have in the global institutions from the UN to the World Bank to the IMF to the G20 and start something new that will, um, that will deal with the current global crisis that we are facing. And my position was that we do not need any kind of new institutions. What we need is reform. And I make this point to say that we can even build the Tower of Babel now. As long as we have leaders that are not interested in the, in the, in the collective humanity, as long as we have leaders who are thinking about um, their own selfish interests, because when a leader, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this, when a leader say, let's make my country great again, that leader is operating from the premise that their country is the only country in this entire universe. And we know that for where we sit, there is no nation in the world that can say I can operate individually. The beauty of the United States of America is not just within its citizens, it's within the immigrants who are doing some of the kind of jobs that a lot of citizens are unable to do. If you go into the care institutions, nursing home, almost 80% of the people working in those homes are immigrants who have come from different parts of the world. The reason why God created, when we look at the rainbow, the beauty of the rainbow is our diverse beauty, our diversity coming together to make a whole. So how do we deal with these things? How do we deal with individuals that are so bent on pushing us further apart rather than bringing us together? I think this is the time in our world where we need to begin to push and fight and advocate for leaders who will come and take stand into spaces where they would um, bring our world closer. One of the questions that I asked someone yesterday was, how is it that 50 years or 40 years later, we're saying that the UN has failed, the IMF has failed, and the World Bank has failed? 20 years after the founding of those entities, we're saying that they were effective for the first 20 years. Why were they effective? It was not just the building that made it effective. It was because we had global leaders from the US to the UK to other parts of the world who were interested in other world countries. It wasn't just about them. So leadership is very key. If you have a leader that stands up to say, COVID is not real, it's a hoax. You will have his followers coming or her followers coming and saying, this is a hoax. If you have a leader who is not concerned about almost half a million people dying and, and it's only about themselves, you will see them, their followers. So leadership is very key. And I'm not just talking about any kind of leadership. Leadership that really speaks to the heart and soul of people. We are not bad people by nature. Generally, everyone has a good side and a bad side. What we need are people who will come and push us so that the good side of us can come out the most. But I, I think leadership is key and core to everything that we do. Let me give another example. During the Ebola crisis in Liberia, when people were, President Sirleaf came out, at that time we had the female president, and she was basically engaged. So people were really coming out and, 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 and believing in the system. And be, even though there were deaths on a daily basis in the streets, the ambulance were working overtime, but there was this persistent briefing that we, were, we are on this journey together. I've seen this in Ghana also. The president gives update, COVID update, updates on the people. So there is that kind of understanding that someone is leading us somewhere. There is that kind of understanding that we are going this way and not a group of people not being, being led by the wind. So I think leadership is core and key into everything we do from the home to the community to global affairs. So as important as leadership is, you first 
kind of broke onto the world scene when your country had a very bad leader, when you had Charles Taylor. And you became a leader and joined with others to create a movement. One of the most inspiring things that we see in your story when we show the film Pray the Devil Back to Hell is that you built a grassroots movement that became powerful enough to, to bring down a dictator. Did you see yourself as a leader then? No, no. I, I saw myself as a technocrat. When I started working with the women, once we put the campaign together, we went into a meeting. I said, now you all will have to find your leader. And the other women in the group said, no, you are our leader. And I was like, no, I don't want to be your leader. Prior to working with those women, I, I shied away from working with women's organization because I lived the old age stereotype of women can work together, women, there's women, that women, the other. But the way I say it is that God has a sense of humor. When, when I became the leader of that group, and I would say by default, I was forced into being their leader or coerced or prayed into being their leader, whatever way we want to see it. The one thing that it became very clear to me that you cannot be interested in the politics and not be interested in the personal. The personal is political. And once people that you work with understand that you, 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 you are compassionate, you, you care about their well-being, and I, I, it is, this is from a national president down to a grassroots leader, you can tell them to do anything and they will follow you. So not only were we, and the other thing was that leadership was not just showing up and being the big bad girl, but leadership was showing up and being the servant. I endeavored to be the first on our protest ground every morning and be the last to leave every day until every woman had gotten transportation to leave or were walking home, I did not leave. I, re I became the last to eat if we had food to eat and the first to serve is the, if there was serving to do. I realized that it was important when there was death in any of the women family, regardless of, I would show up. I would be at the funeral. And once they re these women realized that I was not just invested in peace, but I was invested in their well-being, there was nowhere I could tell them, let's go, that they would not go. One of the things that I've seen in our world today is that people are so hell-bent on, let's separate the personal from the politics. Look at the U.S. today. There is absolutely no way that you can separate the personal from the politics. Everything that comes out of the mouth of your president impacts the way you will sleep or you will wake up or you will pray the personal is political and the political is personal and that was something that i learned from a very early age one old man imam in liberia once said to me when you are a leader you are forced to be warm to everyone but everyone is not forced to be warm to you. Unfortunately for the world we live in today, leaders, leaders in our world feel like everyone should be warm to them and they have no obligation to be warm to people. And that is some of the problem. It's just a simple principle. And as simple as it may look, it is important. If you look at the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, when he went into the communities to do work, he didn't go to restaurants to eat. He sat in the homes of people, interacted with them, got to know their problems. Mandela, I remember when I won the Nobel Peace Prize, we were in Davos that February after we received the prize in December. I had the pleasure of sitting with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who I had only been communicating with by telephone. And this day we sat down, I had my notebook, and I was taking notes because I felt like this is a university class that I will not be able to get from anywhere. It was a crash course on humility. It was a crash course on leadership. And he said to me, my daughter, do you know why Mediva was great? 
speaking of Mandela. And I said, no, sir. He said, Mediba was great because he learned from very early on that it was never about him. It was about the people he represented. If you want to succeed, please always remember that it is never about you. And it is that advice that I take, even when I go to the UN or to big places to speak, because I feel like I'm not representing myself. So I will speak the truth and let history judge me. I will speak it as it is and let the history books say, this was the person. And I've been in situations where people will say, Oh, do you know that so-and-so world leader said they would never ever get and, and nominate you for any blah, 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 because you're like a loose cannon. You fire anywhere at any time. And I said, well, I'm grateful that these same world leaders are the ones who will see me and say, Miss Bowie, we really appreciate you for your commitment to social justice and women's rights. So if they are afraid of me, but they can still compliment me, I'm glad. And I think this is what the world needs. Leaders who are not afraid to lose their jobs. Leaders who are not afraid to not be invited to places. Leaders who are there because they know the people they represent depends on them to make things right in those spaces that they may never be able to get into. And grassroots leaders who will tell the truth. Grassroots is leaders, national leaders, global leaders who will tell the truth. Right yeah. now, they, they, I, 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 there is this um, quote, and I would fact check it, or you, but I think it's from George Orwell that says, in a time of universal deception, truth telling is revolutionary. You know, so we need that. We need that kind of revolution now in the world that we live. I think Cody is ready with the next one. Cody? Yeah, so what you just said now, sort of how we're in need of a revolution of truth. Um, and you spoke quite a bit about young people and the mobilization of youth. And I feel like a lot of young people and those people in my generation are waking up to the truth and are trying to speak the truth, but frequently are silenced or ignored and it's exhausting and i know like i keep trying and i keep trying to foster foster relationships and have those connections and dialogue and um, like bob had mentioned our country is so polarized that those conversations before you can even have them end and so how do you What's your advice to young people and to people who want to continue to speak the truth to persist and foster a resiliency to spread that message of truth in the face of so much scrutiny and backlash? The, I mean, persistence, persistence. You know, when you have passion for what you do, and not just following trending. You know, I always say to young people when I speak to them, you, you go on the internet now, you look in that corner on Google or Yahoo, you will see what is trending, 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 trending. One minute you will see maybe LeBron James is trending. The next minute you will see Oprah Winfrey is trending. The next minute yesterday was the Emmys and you see Tyler Perry and other people. But what you need to understand about what is trending is that it never lasts. One minute, one name will be trending. If you go back maybe five or 10 minutes later, another name will be on top of what was trending first. And the way I tell it to young people is that trending never lasts. It's short term. What lasts is passion, consistency, persistence. And this is where we have a problem in the world that we're in today. We live in a microwave generation. Everyone wants solution very fast. And those women, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tutman, Jean Adams, all of those people who fought for civil rights and voting rights and all of the different rights that we have today, didn't do it in one day. They didn't do it in two days. They didn't do it in three days. It took a lifetime 
But because we live in a world where social media, everyone wants likes, everyone are looking for awards, everyone has, are looking for um, notoriety and global acknowledgement and prizes, we find it extremely difficult to achieve things when we set out to achieve them. So we are quick to give up. But when you are persistent, first, what did Gandhi say? First, they ignore you. Then they make fun of you. Then they start to pay attention. And then they will join you. But it's not one week. It's not two weeks. It's not three weeks. Our campaign for peace lasted for almost three years when we protested. After the signing of the agreement, we didn't go back home. We said, we want to see this agreement. So it's, yes, you will be dismissed. You might be insulted. You will be treated poorly. But at the end of the day, you just have to keep on. Let me give you a story. When we protested for peace, we went to the peace talks in 2003. And these are some of the things that you don't see on camera on, in the documentary. Some of the older women said, oh, when we see the warlords, we should kneel before them and say, please, we need peace. Yeah, because this is tradition that women have to kneel before their husbands or their fathers and their brothers. And the mistake we made was to go and kneel before one of the warlords. And the first thing that came out of his mouth was, oh, you all are kneeling. Next thing we'll be having sex with you all. I told the women, stand up, stand up, stand up. This is total rubbish. We are no longer going to kneel down to anyone. Henceforth, we will engage them eyeball to eyeball, face to face. Oh, they insulted us. They said all kinds of things. They will not meet with us. They won't do this. They won't do that. We didn't have to meet with them. We just had to make our presence felt. Every day we had new message. We were persistent. We were consistent. And at the end of the day, the mediators realized that we're not just jokers. So if you do something one time and you gave up, how else do you expect to succeed? My dear, with all that title that you are getting in December after graduation, you can't change the world if you don't have the balls. You can only change the world if you're persistent. Even now, after winning the Nobel Peace Prize, I still have battles that I fight. It's not easy getting doors open, talking to people, investing or putting, getting the change that you want to see in the world. Sometimes you go to meetings, you talk, people dismiss you. You have to keep pushing, you have to keep pushing. And at the end of the day, someone will say, okay, let's just allow crazy because then they feel you're crazy to come in here, maybe. And once they listen, do you have that audience? Bam, 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 bam. Next thing you see people calling you from left, right, center to say, we understand what you say. How can we move this issue forward? It takes persistence, it takes resilience, it takes commitment. Sometimes it takes your life. One of the questions we have from online here is, as much as we all hope that this is a stepping stone to something bigger, it sometimes feels as though we're investing more than a lifetime. Do you think that the, the goal of equality and peace will ever come about in our lifetimes? You know, I'll give this person hope because they feel like it's, it's not worth the fight. Maybe 15 years ago, no one could publicly talk about female genital mutilation in my country. It was a taboo. You could get attacked, you could be harmed, especially if you had not gone through the process you were told absolutely do not talk about this, regardless of how much you had the public uh, uh, knowing the work that you're doing, you could not talk about it. 15 years later, we have a bill on the floor of parliament to ban FGM. Today, there is a presidential signature on something that bans it as parliament talked about it. Today, traditional rulers who used to send thoughts after people, if you talk about these things, are sitting on radio stations and talking about these things because, and saying that it's a wrong practice and they need to find a way. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it took almost a decade and a half of work 
to get us there. I often get this question, Ms. Bowie, don't you ever feel bad about the length and times that you spent away from your family? My children were very young when I started doing this work. They are all young adults now and I'm still doing what I'm doing. And my response to people is no. And it's not that I'm a bad mother. I feel like whatever I've done in this world is necessary because what I have done with my life work is to ensure that some of the things that I fought for, my daughters will not have to fight for it. So no kind of advocacy, no kind of activism is in vain. What we all are doing, we are building foundations for the next generation to come and stand on. As a social worker, I stand on the foundation that Jane Adams and all of the other women did. As a peace activist, as a women's rights advocate, I stand on the foundation of the Women League for Peace and Freedom who went to go and protest in The Hague. I stand on the foundation of Bertha von Sodner and all of the different women who had been in. So I too, maybe 50 years from now, some girl will sit in that hall of St. Norbert College and say, I stand on the foundation of what Lema Bowie did and I stand on the foundation of what other women have done. Fatou Bensouda, who is at the International Criminal Court, I'm standing on that foundation. So this is not a work to give up from. Every decade, every century has its own problem, but we are able to tackle those problems because of what people who came before us has been able to do. I'll take um, a question here. So this is something that I've been thinking about after I rewatched the film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Um, and one of your quotes that struck me the most, I think you were at one of the peace talks, but you said that uh, because we are the custodians of society, tomorrow our children will ask us, Mama, what was your role during this crisis? And as I find myself living during a global pandemic, and being on a plan transformed by climate change and in a country stricken by violence and division and a steady fight for civil rights, I have also been asking myself that similar question, uh, the question of what story will I tell future generations about my role during this time? And my question for you is that at a time when many of us feel so lost and helpless, how can we each discern what our own role is in this crisis and in our lifetimes? Well, one of the things that I want you to, I want to ask you is, what keeps you awake at night? What are you passionate about? What is it that when you think about, it brings a intense fire in your belly, but when you hold your pen, with that fire and anger in your belly, when you're writing, you're not writing that I want to kill someone. You are writing recommendations for change. Solutions, you are writing solutions. It comes, it comes, it comes. Whatever that thing is, is what you are being called to tackle in our world. On Saturday, I was on another call. Someone said the, the only thing that COVID has done to us now that we can't travel is, is that it's going to make our tongue, the tongue in our mouths, handicapped. So at the end of COVID, we we'll all have twisted tongues because we've talked so much on different things. But I'm making a thing. I don't know if you can see this clearly. You see this circle that I've drawn here? Yeah. yeah. This circle represents our global problems. So I take it down and say, Lima talks about women's rights. And you talk about, what are you passionate about? Um, criminal justice reform. Criminal justice reform. And someone else is passionate about land and someone else is passionate about homelessness and someone else. So everyone has something that they're passionate about. So if you look in this circle again, you are looking at all of the different things. This again represents our global problem. So I'm coming to your criminal justice reform. Whatever you do in this lifetime, yeah, if you look at the criminal justice reform, do you see a tiny dot in there? Yes. That is your impact. So do we say that our global problem is whole again? 
No. You've chipped off something from there. I have chipped off something. Everyone else is chipping off and chipping off and chipping off and chipping off. And before you know it, what we all in our collective efforts have been able to do in the century that we've lived is to chip off this huge piece. So what we have now is not a whole global problem again. It's a global problem that has been tackled by a generation. But what this dark spot, what we've tackled represents to the rest of the world or to the younger generation coming up is that, wow, they came and did this. We too now can pick up our tool and do something else. So this work that you and I have done, not just represent one step forward in changing our world, but serves as an inspiration for the generation to come. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So one of the things you talk about with building movements, you talk about gathering together with people. And you said that when you were out to the uh, marketplace, you would be the first one there and the last one to leave. I know that you've led similar marches and efforts elsewhere. For example, in uh, Israel and the West Bank, you have gathered together with Israeli and Palestinian women who, like the Liberian women, all dressed in white and led long marches, uh, some as many as 30,000 women together. And, and I've spoken to some of those women and they spoke of their, their inspiration from your story. How do we do that when we can't be physically present? How do we do that when we're looking at Zoom, when we're looking at Facebook and these short snippets of conversation that, that turn so quickly ugly? How do we build a movement when we have to isolate from one another during this time? I'll I tell you one thing. You know, two things. One, sometimes when there are global challenges and we want to be involved and we're so far away, the, the, the first feeling of helplessness come over us. But I think the way forward is to look around your community and ask yourself, what can I do from where I am? Because there are problems also where I sit. That's the first thing. The second thing is sometimes just a note to these women or men who are fighting for social justice to say, I see you. I hear you and I'm with you. It's all the inspiration that they need. During this COVID pandemic, I was so far away from my country. I'm here in Ghana. And I was thinking, so we're sending money home to families, family members and making sure that everyone has stack up food in their homes and water. So from my husband's relative to my relatives, to friends, to old people that are my friends in Liberia, we're doing this. And then my assistant diner here and I will sit and I said, I'm thinking about when I come to Ghana, the taxi driver that picks me up from the airport. He's not working. The airports are shut down. Things must be very difficult. And I said, okay, let's try and send something to his family. And then I'm thinking about the girl who braids my hair when I'm here in Ghana. She's not working because all of the salons are closed. Let's send something to her. I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about that. So even though I wasn't home physically to do some of the things that I wanted to do, but I realized that in my tiny capacity from where I sit, I could also impact someone. Fast forward, 
I was telling my daughter because now I found a new joy for Christmas. Every year I do toys in my village. And children walk from like three, four hours a week to come and receive their toys every year. First year we did 300, second year 500, third year 800. Last year we did 1,500 children and I had to run away because I told my kids, the kids are coming from under the ground like the walking dead. They would not stop coming. So this year I'm in Ghana and I say to them, I want to do toys here too. And they say to me, okay, but go through the church. And then I, this young man who, because we can't get our Liberian meals from the regular market. So there's a community far away from here where refugees used to live. And this young man comes and he buys food for us. So I said to him, I want to come on a camp and do something. And he said, I was even thinking about telling you that we have this group we call We Care. These are all boys who are refugees and they come together every week and they feed about 300 children. I went to bed so happy you would think that I won the jackpot in the lottery. I was very happy because at least in this space, in this time, in this hardship, I have the opportunity to reach out to other communities, even though I'm not able. So even if it is mentoring someone, the ultimate goal, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, is to have a just society. Is to have a society where people believe in the collective humanity or in the power of humanity again. And if you can't go to Israel, if you can't come to Liberia, how are you creating that power of humanity with someone next to you? A few years ago when President Trump put the Muslim ban, I was traveling across the U.S. and going to different schools and speaking. And there was this outrage at this particular university that I had gone to. Students filled the hall to come and listen to me speak because I think the, the, the intentions or the thought that they were going to, were going to talk about um, Trump and bash him and everything, everyone came. And the core questions in that entire thing was, how dare he? How dare he? So I asked for students from Muslim countries in the hall to please raise their hand. They did. And I asked students who are from the U.S., how many of you have offered any of these students a meal or have sh shook hands with them or have greeted them and asked them about their nations? No one or maybe very few. My point then was that, don't you think you're going to the airport to protest is hypocrisy? How do you go to protest people that you don't know? The blocking of people that you don't know coming into your country is good, is well and good. When there are people from these same nations who live amongst you that are practically invisible to you, the ultimate goal is to bring faith back into humanity. However way we do it, whichever location we can do it, that is the goal for everything that all of us do, including this Miller Lecture. That's a good word. And it reminds us of uh, the importance of, of acting locally of looking at the people around us. At the same time, when you spoke earlier about the importance of leadership, you were thinking about some of the national and international leaders. And during a time of, of when protests are being canceled, prevented, so that those who used to gather on the streets, particularly in some of the places in the Middle East, were... Uh, kept from it. It seems to give strength to dictators again. It seems to enable those, some to remain in power uh, because the power is no longer in the streets. Have you seen from your experience that strengthening society through these individual local level acts of resilience and courage and kindness is that another way to also weaken dictators? We, 
our movement in Liberia grew from that. Our movement grew from that. Before we even got in the streets, we had to get to know each other. There were women sitting together, and I'll tell a story. We're sitting and praying one day before we outdoed the protest. And one woman was crying, and another woman was crying. And when we asked this question, this woman said, this one sitting here, nephew killed my son and hacked his body into many little pieces and made us to buy those pieces bit by bit in order to bury him. That I'm sitting on the same, in the same room with this person talking about starting a peace movement. I don't want to do that. So bridges have to be built. People have to come together. Others have to come to understand the power of a group that did not see ethnicity or political alliance, but our collective humanity. And that movement or that the beauty of that collective collectiveness that we had was what we outdoored and others joined us and made our group the force that we were. And you see it in small communities. The Israeli-Palestinian women movement that I went to do in Israel came out of that. When you sit with this, those women and tell you that I, I went to Israel in 2008 with the documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And everywhere we screen the documentary, a lot of the Israeli women would say, this is not our reality. Then we went to Palestine to screen the same documentary, and the young women were more charged, and there was a thing between they and the older women. Fast forward, 2014, I get a call from these women to say, in Israel, not Palestine, that we're starting this thing. Why? Because when they did that 2014, 30, 60 days war, whatever it was, one of the women said she woke up this day, her two sons had been drafted into the army, so their wives and their children were home. Her husband is old and he's in the house and she's old. And she said she woke up and she saw these two daughter-in-laws and their children. And she asked herself, what if our sons die? What are we going to do? My husband will not be able to live this. I am not able to do this. So she down white, made a placard and decided she was just going to stand on the streets by herself to say peace. As she came out of her building, she saw someone and the person said, what are you going to do? And long story short, oh, I'm going to do this. It's, oh, but there are a group of women who have decided this is what they want to do. And that was the beginning. So every year, on the occasion of that particular thing, these women go and sit in front of the, the prime minister's house and they protest and fast for the number of days that that crisis lasted. In doing that, we were able to link up with some girls from Palestine who now started that same movement and bridged them together. The day we walked through that Dead Sea, when those women came from Palestine in buses, and these women who have been traveling all through Israel, they started in one small bus, and by the time they ended, it was almost 10 RV buses because Everywhere they went, women were coming and joining the train to say, we too want peace. Most movements don't necessarily start from that top. And any kind of change that we want to see, for it to really take root, must be a change that is rooted in us understanding that regardless of the color of our skin, the higher power, the God, however we want to say who created us, knew that there was one thing that we could not 
pull out or bleach. That is the blood that runs in our veins. And until we begin to note that, regardless of where you come from, we all share that crimson color blood in our vein, and we should treat each other in that way. We can't, you can't build a movement on division. You can't build a movement on hate. You can't build a movement on racism. For any movement to make great change, it has to be built on the principle of equality, love, unity, and friendship. So as, as I said before, I'm taking questions from online and I'm acutely aware of the fact that it's 1.15 in the morning where you are. And so we don't want to give you up too much longer. But there's one question that has been asked again and again. I had it myself. I wrote it early in your remarks. And then I see that several other people have submitted it online. And what you say, uh, it, it encourages us with hope. Your story, your example, seems to, to bolster hope in us. But we also know that there have been many times when hope has felt far away for you. Could you close by telling us a little bit about what keeps you hopeful? If you're hopeful. I, I think you are. You seem to be. Oh, yeah. What oh, makes yeah. you hopeful? You see... The world that we live in today has conditioned us to be individuals who such as we walk the streets, we're looking for negativity. When I'm walking, I'm looking for hope. A few years ago, I'm in New York and I'm late for a meeting and I see three black boys go into a nail salon. For some reason, I'm drawn to them. You know, I always tell my children, African mothers or mothers in general are pineapples because we have eyes all over our bodies. <laughs> so I, I'm drawn to these boys, so I stop. And they come out of the nail salon with a pair of slippers. It gets interesting. They're going left. My meeting is right. I'm already late, but I follow them. And I think it was God leading me. These three young boys, not 18, not 19, not 20, maybe 16, 15, walk over to an old white man. I'm not saying Hispanic white, blue eyes, everything. He's hunched over and he's finding it very difficult moving from point A to point B because the flip-flop he's wearing, the slippers he's wearing were broken. These three boys saw it, went into a store, bought him a new pair of slippers and handed it to him. As soon as they turn around, I ran and grabbed them to hug them, and they all went, whoa. <laughs> and I said, please, don't be afraid. I saw what you did, and I thank you. Can you tell your mothers that they raised very good boys? I walked away from that encounter telling myself, Lema, you can retire because there are young people who will carry on your legacy. I've written a children's book that will come out soon on Amazon based on that story and I've titled it Sons of Peace. There are sons and daughters of peace everywhere, doing acts of peace every day, every minute, every second, every hour. Until we look deep, we will continue to think that our world is dying. If you look deep, you will find them. 
and they will give you hope. And it is that hope that keeps me going. It is that hope that keeps me up at 1.20 a.m. to inspire. Even if it is just one person, it is that hope that one day someone else will walk in my shoes and continue or walk or stand on the foundation that I have built and continue. The hope is there. You just need to look closer. you find it. I wish that we could uh, give you the standing ovation that we would like to give at this moment in our collective Zoom call. We so look forward to seeing you in person here at St. Norbert College in what feels like a very long time, 2022, but we know that it will come soon. Very soon. And I, very, very soon. But thank you so much for this. And I've asked Cody to close us out with the last word, but thank you, thank you. I look so look forward to, to meeting you. I, I didn't tell you before, uh, your picture, since we first started showing Pray the Devil Back to Hell, a very large picture of you has been on the wall of the Norman Miller Center. And when you come, we'll take a new one and replace it. So okay. we'll, put, we'll put a new picture up there. So um, Cody? Again, I want to give the greatest thanks to Ms. Lema Gavoli for joining us tonight for a virtual rendition of the Norman and Lewis Miller Lecture Series. And in this moment of social distancing, may we seek relationship, act with compassion, and promote understanding, for we are indeed far more connected than we are divided. And to our in-person and virtual audiences, thank you for being with us this evening. May we all be sons and daughters of peace. Good night, stay healthy, and love deeply. And rose and crisp, cool cucumber and lime. Making a tasty, sugar-free cocktail has never been easier. Just splash two ounces of Smirnoff Zero Sugar.